Take five or six and eight, take one. It's Wednesday night, so it's midweek. Tony Webber is a likeable, very persuasive man, a good talker. He grew up in East London and learned to sail in his early teens. On the basis of these two talents, he launched a unique project which seized the public's imagination. With some knowledge of social anthropology and a slight connection with Bits University, he spent months on the telephone persuading commerce and industry to sponsor his oil drum raft, donate equipment and raw materials, and buy advertising space on the sides and sails. The SABC contracted to make a documentary about the project and assigned a cameraman to film the construction and voyage. This curious mixture of adventure and advertising cost Tony Webber 14,000 rand in rescue charges. After initial reports that he'd fled the country, Tony Webber returned to pay his debts and put his side of the story. Tony, a great deal's been written about the Apalila exercise. What was it all about from your point of view? Well, basically, it started out as a fundraising vehicle for a second expedition, which I hoped a month, uh, which would have been a pure exercise in anthropology from Borneo and Indonesia across the Indian Ocean to Madagascar and the East African coasts. After trying to get direct finance for the expedition, then I thought, well, why not cross the Atlantic Ocean on an oil drum raft just for fun? And I wake up one night about 3 o'clock in the morning, I don't really know now if I woke up or whether I'd been dreaming subconsciously or thinking about it consciously. But I suddenly woke up and I decided that this was the way to raise the finance. Many people were willing to bet on Weber's idea and over 700 people applied for the 10 places as crew. Their motivations varied. I had to do something for myself, something really, very really difficult and impractical. So I'd proved to myself that I wasn't really the no-good drifter my friends and family thought I was. One's life is not important to you unless you risk it, really. You can lead a secluded life and still not enjoy life as such. When I was young, I wanted to be a spy. I loved living dangerously. I think one of my strongest beliefs is that you can do anything you want to do. I think that was the personification of a hero in the olden times. It was a guy who went out and did things. And it's also this sort of thing that makes a human being great. I'm going because I have been in it for a long time. To get away from everyday living, to do something that's different. The man who designed the raft, Dr. Ed Bennard, a married man, had to withdraw when he was unable to find an insurance company willing to insure his life while on the raft. Several other original crew members also dropped out during the long months of publicity, promotion and fundraising when the race between finance and construction pushed back the departure date. From the very start, the design of the raft was criticized. I'm not a marine architect, I'm a structural engineer. When I started the design of the raft, I discussed it with uh, yachtsmen, marine architects and uh, sailmakers. I did quite an extensive literature survey on the subject, but there was very limited design information on rafts. The raft as designed was essentially from first principles. We tried to make the, the design as safe as possible. We incorporated a number of safety features in the design, but unfortunately during the course of construction, because of lack of finance, a lot of these safety features were omitted. Weber's big problem was to get someone to build the raft. And despite a refusal, he persisted in approaching a large Durban shipbuilding company. And I said to the guy, I said, my name is Tony Weber. I'm a research anthropologist working at the University of Vibarisman. I would like to build a raft to sail across the Atlantic Ocean. I have all the material down to the last nut and bolt. And could your company build it for me? And I'll never forget, he got up out of his chair and he walked over to the window and he lit a cigarette and he had a few puffs and he looked me in the eye and he said, we'll build your raft. Uh, I did get the impression that uh, Tony Weber perhaps lacked uh, practical experience in this sort of thing. I uh, did voice my 
misgivings to him, but uh, he was obviously determined to proceed with the, with the venture, and uh, his uh, craft complied with all our requirements. It was safe enough, it was extremely well constructed. As the raft changed in design, so did the crew. The Durban doctor, Peter Bonifede, joined the team. Everyday existence, I find, gets me a little bit down in that it becomes a little bit boring, a little bit mundane. And so something like this offers me a new challenge, something different to have done, possibly a little bit of an escape from everyday existence, which, as I say, tends to be a bit boring. And while construction was actually underway, the original design was still being changed, and Tony Weber was still on the phone, getting material to build the craft. The shipbuilders lived from hand to mouth. More equipment was added to the long list, only to be sold after the return to Wolfish Bay. Mr. Josephson, how much did it cost you helping to sponsor this Apalila expedition? Uh, approximately 1,200 rand. And what did you supply? Uh, a full range of fishing equipment uh, for trolling and deep sea fishing, plus a, a range of underwater equipment for them, including uh, wetsuits. Now, as one of the sponsors, what actually did you provide? We provided a very large range of protective clothing, ranging from foul and rough weather gear, safety harnesses, uh, sunburn equipment, sunglasses, boots and shoes, gloves, and more specifically, the cold weather gear and the most important of all, the anti-hypothermia jackets. Now, when you approached them, did you discover that they were actually going to sail without an adequate supply of this safety and life-saving equipment? Most astonishing, most astonishing so, yes. Um, in my interview, I found that they hadn't even thought of this aspect. What sort of an impression did you get of Tony Weber himself? He quite impressed me, actually. Uh, he came in here with quite a lot of uh, paraphernalia and press clippings, and uh, uh, I was quite impressed with the idea that he had in hand. So in other words, his basic qualification, he was a good salesman? Excellent salesman. He managed to... Uh, sell his story, he managed to get support for the expedition and I do believe he was the only man who could have pulled something like this off. As time went by we got uh, bigger companies, bigger name companies involved in the expedition and uh, of course the press coverage, the news media coverage in general that we received assisted a great deal and this is the thing in mounting a thing like this is to get the public and the public is Mr. Commerce and Mr. Industry, is to get Mr. Commerce and Mr. Industry aware of what you are trying to do. The two crew members, which were friends of mine that withdrew, withdrew um, because of Tony Weber's um, handling of the financial side of things. He um, initially stated he did not want us to put in money into the venture. We agreed. Um, then he started running short of funds and he proposed that we should put in some money. And we decided, no, fine, we could, he, we could do that if he presented a budget. He didn't want to present a budget, um, so we didn't put in any, any financing, which in the end turned out to be and a good result. Yeah. The success aspect of the whole thing was less important than my fear of failing. Once your name is linked with a thing like this, and the whole country and half the world, and we've had tremendous international press coverage. And you know, you know, without being egotistical, without being vain, without being swollen headed, you know that when your name and your photograph is carried two, three times a week in every newspaper in the country, you know that those people you know 10, 15 years ago, they know who you are and what you're doing. A new and advanced type of mainmast was fitted. But Apalila was moving slowly to a difficult berth. Of course, you left without the, the original proper mast, didn't you? Um, yeah, the original mizzen mast wasn't uh, fitted, actually. The one that was ordered wasn't fitted. We had this uh, makeshift wooden pylon supplied, I think, by the railways. The Apalila weighed 23 tons and took about five months from the drawing board to the launch. Approved by the South African Railways and Harbours, it measured 13 metres by 6 metres. I name this craft Apalida. God bless all those who stayed in her.
floating a little bit lower in the water than I would have hoped. But she looks pretty good so far. I'd like to see her fully loaded, and I would like on the sea trials to see how she'll operate. Maybe she has the full crew on board, plus all the equipment. Do you think she'll make it to one today? Well, we certainly hope so. <laughs> well, my first job was to draw up a list of materials that would be required for the construction of the raft. Once I'd drawn up a list of materials that would be required, my next job was to go through the yellow pages and find companies that actually marketed or manufactured the materials that would be needed and try and get sponsorship from these companies. Initially it was very, very difficult, but I would say now we have a success ratio of probably 10 out of 10. Tony caused a little bit of ill feeling sometimes, at times actually. He seemed to go off the handle very easily mm. for silly little reasons, totally he, unnecessarily. Yeah. Do you think he was under a lot of strain? Well, no more than anybody else. And I was a bit worried to hear tonight that somebody mentioned that things were slightly disorganized and disjointed. <laughs> and let's get one thing straight from the start. Things will be slightly disorganized and disjointed. <coughs> For the next few days, we're going to just have to bear with one another. And there are going to be orders and requests and instructions and tempest frayed and tempest flying and there's going to be drama but we're going to get it finished and we're going to get it ready for Saturday for sea trials and the way she is now there's no way we're going to have sea trials on Saturday we're all prepared to go out now problem. and have a look at it yeah. and carry on working until 4, 5, 6 o'clock in the morning it looks ready and why wasn't the rope put through the guardrails? because it was wet Cal, please see that this gets done Tony, there were four of us left there, and I asked three of them, the other three guys, what is the, what is the position? Should we go and have supper and come back with something to keep us dry so we can work through the whole night? Or should we just stay there and get nowhere? And how do you know you're going to get into the yard now at quarter past 11 to finish Well, the it? security guards all night. Right. Well, well, we've got to do it, so let's decide what we're going to do about it. Well, that's what we're going to do. We're going to be, if, it, if the weather's good and it's not blowing too much, if we can somehow patch up that thing, we might be able to get away with it. If it's not, I suggest we roll up the two middle uh, flaps. I reckon we do it in any case. We won't be able to roll it up. Roll those guys are going to put those eyes It's too long. It's coming down to the deck too long, leaving that by six. Right, so and the idea that I presented the time is extra, extra strips. Yeah. 11 o'clock, I think we should just bust and go and get the thing done. Don't you think so, Tony? Right. There were many clashes of personalities between most of the crew. Well, this is expected of, of um, with, you know, lengthy preparation. Um, the most interesting clash, as far as I was concerned, was the clash between Tony Webber and myself. I um, felt that he was sweet-talking me right from the start. And as the crew took stock of one another, settled down to a routine, the vital sea trials were held. In any vessel's life, this is the proof of her seaworthiness, a time when faults must be ironed out, faults which might be trifling in the quiet waters off the bluff, but are magnified when out of sight of land in a rough sea. True harmony, the moment 
the uh, statement that she could sail three times around the world was my own. And I voiced that opinion after I had inspected the rock. And I meant every word that I said. She was extremely well constructed, mainly of steel. Flotation was uh, through 180 44 gallon drums which had been galvanized inside and out. And I meant precisely what I said. She was physically capable of sailing three times around the world. And were your sea trials adequate? No, they weren't. Um, basically, the only reason we went out from Durban Harbour and wallowed off in front of the beachfront was to give our sponsors. Uh, the benefit of the advertising that they taken on, on board the raft and by virtue of the fact that television people and the press were down and expected to see some sort of sea trial. But we were not ready nor were we prepared the, for the sea trials. Now, Tony Weber and his crew, anything strike you? Did you get any impressions about them? Well, in discussing and having got to know them fairly well during the sourcing of their safety equipment, they were certainly novices at sailing and I feared for their safety. I think it's unfortunate that adequate sea trials were not carried out as I feel that the problems in the steering of the raft would have been discovered during sea trials. These could have been corrected and the voyage could have then been carried out successfully. No other sea trials were held in Durban and Tony Weber said that trials would be held in Wolfish Bay. So the raft was loaded for the trip up the west coast. For transporting the raft from Durban to Wolfish Bay, the fee there would have cost us in the region of six or seven thousand rand. But the shipping company that took the raft from Durban to Wolfers Bay didn't charge us for it because we gave them advertising and they got certain public relations mileage out of it. In Wolfish Bay, the makeshift mizzen mast was rigged, simply a telephone pole supplied by the railways. No sea trials were held in Wolfish Bay either, and vital safety harness and lines were still not on the raft. We were supposed to have had winches or some sort of mechanical device to um, help us hoist and lower the sails. We didn't have this. When I arrived in Morpheus, nothing had been done. It took a lot of confidence to bring a project like Apalila that far. To postpone departure at that stage would have required a remarkably calm judgment, especially when the media were watching. And, and then you faced the Atlantic. Correct. Don't you think that's highly <laughs> irresponsible? In retrospect, yes. Um, obviously, one must agree with you. But then again, you must bear in mind that every day in Walfers Bay before we left was expense. And one must bear in mind again, uh, again that the Apple Leela fund was non-existent. It had run out. There was no money left in the fund. And the money to support the crew and accommodation, etc., etc., in Walfers Bay was coming out of my own pocket, and I was fast running out of money. So I figured the best thing to do was to hoist <laughs> sail and get going. It doesn't sound like the best reason to me somehow. Did you really think that you were going to make it? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so did the crew of Apalila, now reduced to six from the original ten. So, short of money and riding the tiger of public expectation which he'd created himself, Tony Weber had to set sail with a vessel which was under-equipped and entirely unproven. Determined to get the best out of this opportunity, cameraman Brian Dushar had a tractor tube brought on board from which he could film the raft from a distance. Once outside the harbour mouth, swells and seasickness began inexperienced crews struggled to find their sea legs. Only Tony Weber had done any small boat sailing beforehand. The 
last wave from the tug left the seven of them entirely to their own resources for three, perhaps four months. There were already signs of serious divisions and clashes among the crew. I think there is a, a very high standard of self-discipline amongst the crew. Maybe because we're all individuals. That's why we have fights, why we have uh, our controversies. The crew are critical of Tony. And it is known that when someone is an upset in a team, the lead is the obvious man to pick on. Cameraman Brian Duchat spent the first two days flat on his back, seasick, and swallowing pills which Peter Bonifede administered. The rudders proved difficult to control, requiring constant effort, and were too small to be effective. no meat carried, only an artificial mince. The intention was to rely on fishing to supplement the dehydrated vegetables, peanuts, raisins, cereal and canned fruit. Two people were on watch at a time. Those not on watch had plenty of routine activities to fill their time. All the crew had a specialized function besides their crew duties. that finally disabled the raft occurred on the third night. The crew on watch had lashed the rudder and a gust of wind had turned the raft side on before they were able to correct it. At 12 o'clock I finished my shift and uh, went down to sleep and about 3 o'clock that morning we were all woken with a tremendous banging noise and, and the whole raft was shuddering and everybody was called up on deck and we discovered that uh, they had lost control of the raft and the thing had swung around and the sail was blowing totally out of control and we had to bring this thing down and um, once we brought the sail down we couldn't get it up. Hands up on the starboard sheets! About 45 minutes later <clears throat> um, there was another uh, tremendous shuddering going on and everybody was once again called up on deck and we discovered that the uh, wind had uh, shifted the mizzen mast which was bolted down. We had a, a, a wooden a wooden mizzen mast mm. and the supports had cracked and this thing was threatening to fall over and pull all our radio antennas down and whatever you so say. Everybody was up on deck trying to, uh, trying to um, get this mizzen mast back up again mm. and half an hour later we managed to secure that and once again we were um, resting or trying to sleep and another half an hour after that, we had a fire scare when uh, some of the wiring for our battery chargers and radio, radio batteries uh, had shorted and um, the cabin started filling up with smoke. And we were once again called up to try and douse this bit of fire. In the wind that was blowing, the crew found it impossible to raise the mainsail and rigged a storm sail instead. But the rudders were too small to be effective in turning the raft. And in fact, Brian Duchat almost went overboard that night. In trying to control the sail, he grabbed a rope to try to bring it down and was lifted off his feet. At that stage, of course, we were just drifting in the wrong direction. Although the wind was blowing in the right direction, we were drifting with the current which was towards the uh, coast. How difficult was it to control that sail? Very difficult. Once it was up and we were headed in the right direction, there was no problem. But the moment we had a wind shift, and the thing started billowing too much when it rained. Once it was down, we couldn't get it up until the wind dropped. 
Drifting towards the skeleton coast, the crew radioed Warfish Bay for help and sent up flares to mark their position. Several ships in the area converged on the Apalila as well as the Warfish Bay tug. What went wrong? Oh, we had, we had rudder problems. Um, in fact, the rudders were ineffectual, completely ineffectual. We had no control over the raft. Um, I would say that was one of the least of your problems, surely. When you're out in the Atlantic with a, a pretty heavy sea running and a 40 mile an hour wind gusting, um, and you have no control over a raft, then it certainly presents a serious problem, I assure you. Initially, we had designed far uh, larger rudders. The area of the original design, the rudder was approximately four times the area of the rudder as it was finally built. The raft drifted two days and two nights, helplessly awaiting the arrival of the rescuers. The crew drank the champagne to be reserved for arrival in South America. And Brian Duchard jokingly sent a note in the bottle. Standing on the cabin, Fritz van der Merwe holds one of the last few flares as the fishing trawler Deo Valente struggled to find them. Preparations were made to take a tow as the Deo Valente approached. And there she was. By one of those strange coincidences of the sea, the Deo Valente, whose name means God willing, had been with the Apalila in Durban and was the first to find her again. But fishing trawlers have a job to do, so the Deo Valente waited by the Apalila until the Warfish Bay tug was visible. And by sunrise, the raft and crew were humbly being towed back home. A 49-hour journey costing 14,000 rocks. I got the impression that Tony had made up his mind once he'd radioed for help and he, he was finished with the expedition. Uh, it was definitely confirmed by him on, on the tug while we were being towed back. He said that he was finished, definitely. He wasn't going to go on with it and, in fact, asked the crew, the rest of the crew, uh, Diz Duffy and Fritz van Amerwe in particular, whether they would like to take it over on their own responsibility. And we had a bit of a debate on board the tug that night, um, a feasibility debate. And it was decided eventually, well, Fritz and Diz decided not to after a while. Estimates of the cost of modifications vary from 2,000 to 12,000 rods. What it would have cost the crew in determination and perseverance was obviously too much. Montevideo must have seemed very far away. Uh, 20 minutes after they were actually picked up uh, by the rescue tug, I spoke to Tony via radio telephone and um, tried to find out what had gone wrong. He promised to contact me, but he did say in parting that it, if it wasn't for our equipment, they would have all been dead. And we were hoping to hear more from him, but since then we haven't heard a word. And I think when you came back, some people suggested perhaps to avoid creditors. I, I think you did it for other reasons as well. No, first of all, I didn't disappear, um, contrary to what you and anybody else may read in the newspapers. After we landed at Walfus Bay, when we got back to Walfus Bay, I spent at least two weeks in the country trying to sort out the mess. I had negotiations with railways and harbours and other people, and I went overseas purely and simply to get away, have a break, and have a rest. A man who runs away from his problems doesn't come back three months later to sort them out. Did you ever get any of your equipment returned? Uh, no, nothing at all. If they came to you again, would you help them again? Uh, no, I'd have my reservations. All right, one last question. Would you try again with him? Not with him. I would employ him as my PR, but I wouldn't sail with him, no. The Apalila, the dream and the reality. Well then, 
It'll be a long time before anybody else tries that, I think. But uh, if you've got a few oil cans in your backyard and you're thinking of making a raft, before you bang another nail in, why don't you give uh, Tony Weber a call? Because I think probably he'll have a lot of good advice for you from midweek. Good night.